Hey everyone, it's Alex of the PCRI, and currently I'm doing a series where I am bringing to you other people in the prostate cancer advocacy world who are making an incredible impact in this space. And because of the position that I have at PCRI, I get to meet a lot of people and know about all sorts of projects, and I'm not really doing you a service unless I'm bringing it to you. So I get to present somebody that I've known from the beginning of my 10-year prostate cancer career. He is a Harry Pinshot winner, which is an award that we give to people who have done incredible work in prostate cancer and advocacy. He has been a longtime friend of mine, but one of the best things about this guy is that not only has he survived five different cancers, he has an incredible attitude do, like doing it. He has his own organization called Cancer ABCs. Their job is to take you from surviving to thriving. Tons of different things. You may have heard their podcast and I'm super excited to have him. I call him my walking miracle uncle, but to you guys, he's Joel Nowak. So Joel, thank you so much for being here. It's an absolute pleasure and, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to reach out and speak with your audience. So thank you very much, Alex, and thank you, PCRI. In Cancer ABCs, you guys have a ton of different projects that you work on, but can you talk about some of the research projects and abstracts that you're presenting? I know that you've done work in patient language and, and in a lot of different areas. So can you speak to that? When I had the reoccurrence, uh, I started with uh, Mail Care, which is another advocacy organization. And I basically you know, created a number of, of metastatic prostate cancer programs because that's what I was interested in, including writing a blog about metastatic prostate cancer, which basically the most part was translating research into plain language um, and uh, so that patients could read and understand it and ask better questions of their doctor. And I did that for many, many years and, and was involved in a support group uh, in, that was ongoing with male care. And I then started as part of male care, a metastatic uh, prostate cancer support group that met on a monthly basis. Um, and I work with other projects with male care. Um, but that's how I started. And I wanted, being a multi-cancer person, I wanted to expand my focus a little bit beyond what male care was doing to include other cancers and, and take a different approach. Uh, so I founded, I, I left male care and founded Cancer ABCs. And Cancer ABCs is, is you know, although we are 95% prostate cancer, because that's really the area where my expertise is, and person I work with, Jan Mannerite, also has an expertise in that area, um, as does Wendy, my wife, who is also my co-founder uh, of Cancer ABCs. I wanted to do something that would generalize beyond just prostate cancer, because I thought a lot of the things that I had discovered or found in my multiple journeys with different cancers and also have an, uh, an autoimmune illness, which also is a chronic illness. Um, I felt there was a lot of universals that could help people not only with prostate cancer, but any sort of chronic illness. So we started creating, basically it started out as a web page where we talked about some of the things I've talked about in this video or these videos, whatever it turns out to be about medical notebook and second opinions, which we really haven't discussed, but uh, how you put your medical team together, who should be on your medical team, and most importantly, what should your role be on your medical team? And these are really universal, no matter what the cancer is. You know, and and as I've said, oftentimes you can take when you read our webpage, we often say cancer or we say prostate cancer, but you could throw out those two words and say whatever the illness is you're dealing with, uh, an autoimmune illness, uh, Parkinson's, it doesn't really matter. Because a lot of these things are universal. How do you put your medical team together? What should your role be? Um, what you know? How do you how do you work on the caregiving side? And so we want to go in a little bit of a of a different direction, and and so that's why I left male care. Um, but we still stay a very prostate oriented, and uh, so we work with a lot of prostate cancer patients. But we also work with pe people you know who are you know on different cancer type journeys. Um, we're not as able to give a lot of the specifics to their cancers, but we're able to basically help these people set themselves up so that they understand and learn how to educate themselves and how to put these same things together, their medical team. It's the same thing, it doesn't matter. How do you put your team together? How do you interact with them? What's gonna be important to you? And we do a lot of exploration in that area. 
Can you share about your podcast? I love your podcast. I mean, I like listening to your voice. It's a nice voice to listen to, but it's very educational. You have some incredible guests on there. Can you share what made you want to start it and what you think the the benefits are? Yeah, so as yeah, I absolutely will. So as I mentioned, we're a small company compared to a lot of other advocacy organizations. And, and so to some extent, the numbers of our reach within the prostate cancer community and with other communities are not as necessarily as large as as they are with other organizations that are larger and have a mailing list of 10,000. I have a mailing list of, of, of a thousand, you know? And so I was thinking about, well, what can we do to actually broaden our impact? Um, and it's gotta be something that lasts. Um, and so I said, well, you know, and I don't know that anyone else is really doing podcasts in, in the prostate cancer community. I don't think they are. So we're doing podcasts and have been doing it for a few years now. Uh, Unfortunately, I don't have as many given the time as I would like to have because of time constraints, but, um, and they're not just about prostate cancer. So what I love about prostate cancer is I have a chance to do what you're doing here, Alex, to sit down with somebody and have a conversation. I said, I've been very happy with my guests. So um, I have a podcast with a gentleman by the name of Mark Hall, who was diagnosed with uh, very aggressive, very advanced prostate cancer. And he talked about you know, what it was like to be, and these are things that probably any of us listening to these podcasts, if their patients have kind of experienced at some level anyway, or their family has, uh, we, he talked about his experience about being diagnosed with prostate, with metastatic prostate cancer and trying to grab, get his, his mind around that concept. And, and I think we had a really nice interview because I went back to my understanding that I had a reoccurrence and, uh, the story was about him. It wasn't about me, but I think I, under, you know, the empathy. Uh, so Mark, Mark's was very interesting. Uh, I am a huge advocate of, of a treatment called Provenge. And so we have a couple of, of, of uh, podcasts about Provenge to try to help people understand what it is. Cause it's a treatment that's certainly when it was launched was a lot different than any other treatments available. Um, it still kind of remains that way. Um, and that people don't think that people truly understand the potential impact it can have. And so we've done a podcast with somebody who's had Provenge and they talk about what it was like to get and what the experience was in the process. And I have an interview with, with uh, one of the medical people from Dendrion, which is the company that, that manu that makes Provenge. Uh, and we went over some of the survival advantages that Provenge uh, offers. And then we also did a podcast on, on, treatments and particularly we were focused on Provenge, but it goes beyond the treatment advantages that these drugs can and do often based on clinical trial data offered to African-American men. Um, and I think that that's something that really is not adequately being publicized that African-American men for a number of our advanced treatments seem to respond better, get a longer positive effect. Provenge being one, and I think enzalutamide, I think there's research that shows that. Uh, and I'm sure there, I know there are a couple of others. Uh, so we need to get this, get the word out to, to, to not only the prostate cancer community, but those of brothers of ours who are African-American that these treatments are going to work. They, there's a good chance that they're going to work, not only going to work, but they're going to actually work better for you. So heck, take advantage of them. One of the projects that I've gotten very involved with is, is plain language translation and interpretation. I've, you know, I've been writing a scientific blog. I have, I've been negligent the last couple of months because I've been so busy doing other things, but it's always been, and that's the thing that Daryl first sent me to do. My first task was to write a blog. And he said, write a blog about advanced prostate cancer. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you do, but you got to promise me you're going to write every day of the week. And I said, well, I'll promise you I'll write five days a week. And he said, okay. And that's how I got started. He started me on that. And I had the advanced prostate cancer blog on the mail care uh, webpage. And basically, what was I doing? I was taking research and I was translating it to plain language. Um, right. That was my, that I did other things, but that was one of the things I didn't realize I was doing it at the time, you know, because I didn't know enough and think about it enough. It's like I had to write. So, what am I going to write about? Well, that's a really interesting study. What does it mean? I don't know. Well, let me figure it out. Let me Google everything. Let me, let me figure it out. And then let me tell people what it means. And, and then more importantly, what it means could mean to them so that they can go back to their doctors and right. say, is this something that makes sense for me? This is what I understand. And then they could engage 
in an intelligent conversation with their clinicians. And that's, you know, one of the things that we push very heavily on Cancer ABCs, what your role should be. You should be directing your clinical team. Uh, your clinical team should not be directing you, but you have to be educated and you have to know what you're talking about. You can't just jump in and do it and say, well, I think, because why do you think that? And it's got to be grounded in the reality. And and our best reality is is the fantastic research that's happening. And so how do I, as a patient, understand this research? So I, I was doing that without realizing I was doing that for quite a while. Um, and I recently have really started to understand that. And, you know, and I've done a lot of work with helping to develop clinical trial protocol because I wanted to make sure, especially when you get to consent agreements, they're, they're full of jargon. And right. a patient right. has to sign this consent agreement, but most of them have no idea what they're signing. And they don't right. understand, they don't understand. And that, that's frankly wrong. And it's not wrong on the patient side, it's wrong on the structure side, that it should be written in language that a patient can understand. Um, it shouldn't, there should be no jargon in the right. document they're signing and they should truly understand their rights, you know, as they participate in a clinical trial. And right. it shouldn't be in funny long words that you have to Google, okay? It's right. wrong.